Okay, so I'm looking at the second part of our introduction to vectors, which is going to take on some additional topics here. Um, so the first thing that we're going to come across here is the idea of scalar multiplication. All we mean by scalar here is that we're going to take a vector and we're going to multiply this by a real number. So in the definition here, we're going to let C be a real number. Um, v is a vector. And we're going to kind of define this by parts. So if I take C times V, um, I'm going to get a vector. So a scalar times a vector is a vector, and it's going to be a vector such that the following is true. If I take the magnitude of C times V, this is going to give me the, mag the absolute value of C times the magnitude of V. And it will have the same direction as V when C is positive and the opposite direction of V when C is negative. Okay, so what's really going on here? Um, if I have a vector V, right, and I multiply it by C, so let's say C is 3, 3 V is going to be a vector that has three times the magnitude of V in the same direction as V. Negative three V, however, which is a negative number, is gonna be a vector that's three times the magnitude of V, but in the opposite direction. So this is how we define scalar multiplication. It doesn't change the direction so much as it changes the magnitude. The only change in direction it can have is it can change it in the opposite direction and that's when the scalar is something less than zero. Okay, it should be noted that if I multiply the zero times a vector I'm going to get the zero vector or if I multiply a scalar times the zero vector I get the zero vector. So whether the scalar or the vector are zero, the product will also be zero. Okay, so this actually gives us a way to try to analytically understand vector subtraction. Okay, so let's take two vectors. Let's take a vector V and a vector U. And I'm actually going to set them up. So this one is V, this one is U. And I'm going to set them up so that they both share an initial point. Okay. So my argument here is that subtraction can be demonstrated from this drawing. Okay, so my first move is to say where is negative v in this drawing so u's going this way v is going this way which means negative v is going to have the same magnitude as v but in the opposite direction okay so what i'm going to do from there is I'm going to slide V over. 
Okay, so the position is irrelevant. So U is going to stay put. There's U. Okay, and now I'm going to move V from over here, or negative V from over here, right? So the position of negative V was over here. Well, I don't need it to be over there. I could, in all honesty, make it over here. So if you think about what's kind of going on there, I've now created it so that it's tip to toe, right? So I have U here, I have negative V here. So if I add U to negative V, that should go from the initial position of U to the terminal position of V, which means this vector here is U minus V. Now, if I look at that in relationship to the original drawing, that vector is actually here. These vectors, so this is still the vector u minus v. These two vectors, so let's talk about the two that we're talking about here, show the two that we're talking about. These two vectors, this guy here, and this guy here have the same magnitude and direction, which means that I can actually start with this initial drawing where the two vectors share an initial value. And if I go from the terminal point of V to the terminal point of U, the resulting vector should be U minus v so this gives us uh, a visual understanding of vector subtraction so you join them at their initial value and then you connect their two terminal points from v to u okay so this is all still non-numeric it, it's like we're working with uh, um, a system where Everything is just drawings and kind of abstract images. So we want to start putting some numbers to this. So what we're going to do is we're going to create um, some rectangular, sometimes called Cartesian component representation. How do I represent vectors as a kind of set of components? Okay, so like if I'm in R2 and I'm in two dimensions here, what I do is I take my vector, and remember position is irrelevant with a vector, and I stick it so that its initial point is at the origin. And then I look and say, okay, what is the location of the terminal point? So let's say that this terminal point is at the location 3, 4, right? So it has gone um, over 4 and up 3, right? So this vector, we'll call it vector u, can be represented as the vector 3, Okay, so that's a, a, another way of doing this. So you just kind of situate the vector as though it were at the origin, look at where the terminal point would be, and that gives me the component representation. Uh, you can do a similar thing with this in three dimensions, right? So we now have X, Y, and Z. The same idea would work. So let's say I have some vector V that's kind of launching off into space. So I'm gonna try to see if I can represent a vector that's starting at the origin, right? And it's gonna come out three over four and up five. So there's its terminal point. So there's my vector, right? Coming out three over four, and this is up, right? So this is up from above here. 
five, right? So this is the point three, four, five out in space, which means if I call this vector v, then vector v would be the vector three, four, three, four, five in component form. Okay, so this is a little bit more useful of a form than just talking about vectors of having some semblance of a direction and a magnitude because we can now um, actually get a numeric value for these things. Um, so we give a name for these things, uh, these vectors where they actually do start at the origin. These are what we're going to call position vectors. Um, so vectors, there we go, position vectors. Um, let's clean that up a little bit. There we go. Position vectors. Okay, so let me uh, take a moment here and try to more formally define what those are. Okay, so what is a position vector? So let's say that P is a vector. And the components of P are the same as the location of its terminal point then this is then we call this a position vector so essentially this forces the initial point of the vector to be um, the origin and it launches off and its terminal point is the same as its components so at this point we have to do a little bit of backtracking um, because we have some concepts hanging out there, but we don't have them defined in this component idea. So we're going to redefine a displacement vector. So we're going to give it a component definition now so that we can get some more clarity on this. So if we let A be a point at X1, uh, y1 and z1 and b be at a point x2 y2 z2 then we can make a displacement vector so these are points that are in r2 right so we can make a displacement vector we'll call it r or we could call it vector a b it's the displacement from point a to point b so this component wise would be x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1, z2 minus z1. So this will start us at point A, end us at point B, and this will describe the displacement between these points. So then we can say, that r is the displacement vector from a to b Likewise, we can establish a component definition for the magnitude. 
And this gives us a real sense of a norm. So if I'm in R2, my magnitude, so let's say I have V being a vector with V1, V2, V1, V2, then the magnitude of V is just going to be the two norm of this. So it's going to be V1 squared plus V2 squared, square rooted. Okay. So that's just going to give me the distance that this thing would displace from the origin or its magnitude. If I'm in R3, um, so this would give me like, let's say a vector U where I have U1, U2, U3, right? So the magnitude here is just an extension of the formula. So it's just going to be u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u3 squared and square root of the whole thing. And this is, you could extend this into higher dimensions if we need to, um, but it's how it plays out. So definition of magnitude is pretty simple. Um, we can define also vector addition in terms of components. So let's let A be the vector A1, A2, A3. We'll put these things in R3. And B, B, B1, B2, B3, also in R3. Then this would imply that A plus B should be a1 plus B1, A2 plus B2, and A3 plus B3. Okay, so this gives us, we're just going to, addition is just done component wise. Nothing much of a mystery there. Finally, we can also do a component definition for scalar multiplication, which kind of brings us back up to where we started today with the classical understanding of vectors. So if I do a vector definition of scalar multiplication, um, C is a scalar in R. We'll let A be a vector in R3. And to do the scalar multiplication, so C times A is just a matter of multiplying the C by each of the components. So it's almost feeling like a distribution. You just scale each of the components appropriately and you get scalar multiplication. So like a quick little note here is this fits what we said before because if I take the magnitude of CA, that's going to give me, let's see, the square root of CA1 squared plus CA2 squared plus C A three squared, which should be the square root of C squared times A one squared plus A two squared plus A three squared. And if I take the square root of a square, I get the absolute value of C and the piece that's left is going to be the magnitude of A. Aha. So this aligns up with our classical understanding. So there's a little bonus for you at the end here. Quick little proof of why that still works when we're in component form.